Thank you for, uh, for joining me here today. I'm going to talk about something that, in most cases, people don't really think about. Mobile security is something that is um, done over there. Somebody else does it. The mobility people do it. And we, as security experts, don't necessarily put this into our everyday experience. Um, I uh, just give you a bit of background about myself. My name is Scott Kite. I have been in the mobile business for a very long time, just about 20 years now. Um, I started a long time ago as one of the first people in the U.S. selling BlackBerry devices, if you think back to those days. Um, and, you know, I saw the devices come. I saw smartphones go from uh, zero to hero. I saw BlackBerry go from zero to hero to zero and hopefully com becoming hero again at some point in the near future. Uh, so I've seen a lot of stuff change. Um, I remember, like, a very specific example was uh, I remember sitting in a, in a restaurant in New York City, and I looked over, and I saw somebody with a BlackBerry device. And I was like, with my, my buddies, I was like, look, that guy has a BlackBerry. The, you know, the things that we're selling, this is amazing. We're see it the, seeing it in the real world. Um, then somebody pointed out to me a few weeks ago, if I went to New York and I saw somebody on a BlackBerry, I'd probably say the exact same thing now. But that's a different story. Um, we've seen these things kind of grow from nothing to something. But they grew in a kind of a weird way. They grew in a way where us as companies believed back in the day, we're going to buy devices. These devices, like BlackBerry devices, are secure, and we're going to give them to our employees because we get a really good return on investment out of these devices. Something like um, it's going to cost us 50 bucks a month, and we get $3,000 out of it. I mean, that's a great investment um, as a company. Um, and then they figured out something, something really, really interesting. What if we don't even have to pay the 50 bucks and we still get the ROI? Oh, that's great. And what that ended up being is that people buy their own devices and they support their own devices. And as a company, that seems like a really good way to save some money or even actually make money. Um, and in the world space, it, it means that we are now at over 7 billion devices because people think, hey, I get a return on investment out of this device too. It's not just my company. I get something out of this. I get to play games, not be bored, surf the web, whatever I'm going to do with the device. I get to do that anytime I want without any interference, and I get to access my work stuff, and I get to do all these other great things. All wonderful. Except for the fact that us, as security experts, sort of let it happen. It, it was over there. Somebody else was managing it. It wasn't my problem. The problem is, well, the bad guys understand that particular point of view. If we're not looking at something, we need to think about it. If something is going on over there, somebody else is going to be paying attention to something is going on over there. Um, and like I said, those bad guys figured this out. They figured out how to look at those devices and take data off of those devices. The last, conference, uh, last little session was about data exfiltration. Mobile devices are actually a definite point of exfiltration of data, as well as entry points of data. Um, and since we're not looking at them, you know, that's kind of an issue. So in this example, we can see that there are a few attacks uh, that have occurred over time against mobile devices. These are just some of the attacks. So most of these are the ones that uh, Checkpoint, what the company I work for, I won't be selling anything today. I just talked a little bit about it. But we've done a lot of research into this and um, found a number of different types of attacks, both uh, uh, application-based and uh, physical-based and other things onto devices. Um, and not only are we seeing attacks in general, we see very large-scale attacks. Like we saw one that was called Copycat that affected, I believe, it was like 12 or 13 million users. Um, and uh, we found ones that, like, um, uh, there was an attack against some uh, doctors at UVA, lasted over 19 months of attacks. And we think about this, and I, I, will, I will challenge you, if you're a security expert and you have an attack in your network active for 19 months, where are you looking for a new job? Because you're probably not going to be continuing there. That is one of those things that we as a, a security expert group need to understand that that exists and we need to stop that type of attack from occurring ahead of time, not let it sit in our networks for 19 months. And just to put those numbers again in perspective with the rest of the types of attacks that exist out there, um, if we are looking at regular attacks, attacks that hit front page news, things like WannaCry, Locky, Petya, not Petya, all of those massive ransomware attacks, well, the scale of those attacks actually isn't that great. The effect is amazing, and it's terrible, and it was uh, very destructive. But the numbers of devices affected were measured in the hundreds of thousands max, total, for all of them. But that hit front page news on every newspaper, every web page, every news article you can think of. For months, that hit the, the front page. But if we look at the attacks on mobile devices, like Copycat, like I had said, it was, well, actually, it's 15 million devices. Hummingbat is a different type of an attack. 
hit 10 million devices. Um, we've seen Judy hit another 12 million. We've seen another couple of attacks, uh, attack types hit 36 million. Um, so the numbers of devices affected with true data exfiltration, unbelievable numbers. But we're not talking about it because, again, as security experts, we're not looking at it. Um, it's not destructive in the same way that WannaCry, Lock Locky, and Petya, not Petya were. It, it's just data exfiltra exfiltration, just an attack. Um, and then um, uh, to, to get into uh, my, uh, to get into the details here, so let's talk about a couple of these attacks. Judy is one of those attacks. If you're not familiar with um, some of these attacks, you know, feel free to come and talk to me later. We can talk about uh, some of these attacks in detail. Um, Judy was an attack against basically the advertisement engine of your device. Now that doesn't sound really creative. It just sounds like, well, why do I care about the advertisement engine of my device? Well, just let's back up for a second. What does an advertisement engine do? It's designed to track you, to understand what your interests are, understand what types of places you frequent, what types of things that you might be interested in. Well, as a hacker, what do I want to understand for social engineering? I want to understand where are you going, who are you talking to, what types of things are you interested in? That seems like a really good pairing. It really seems like a good place to get data, get information, and get some way to understand you better. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. So what we did as hackers is create an engine that would replace the advertisement engine of a device. And rather than providing Google you know, with, hey, John was here at this particular Macy's, and he was walking past this particular counter. Um, and uh, telling Google this information, and then Google reselling that out anonymously, it just says, hey, John was here, he went here, he went to Starbucks at this time, bought these two things, um, was in the office by 9 a.m., uh, met with the CFO in, early in the morning, then left, and then, you know, very, very detailed uh, steps, very detailed information about individual users, which as a hacker, that's invaluable. If I understand my target, then I can plan a good social engineering, a good next step. And just to put this in a different light, all of the stuff that I'm talking about, all the stuff found, all of the information that could be stolen, you would have no idea it was taking place because you're not protecting against mobile device, mobile device infiltration. Because again, I can tell because Judy hit you know, 10, 15 million devices across the world, and the other ones hit 20, 30, 40 million, and most people don't know anything about them. Um, another type of an attack was called BankBot. Um, now, this one is a little bit more specific, although it's been used a number of times. It's been used both in a corporate sense as well as an individual sense. Uh, the basic idea is that BankBot was incorporated into a bunch of other applications. Uh, it affects Android devices specifically. Um, and if you ran an application that was infected with BankBot, um, it was infected, actually, the infections were done at the API level um, and affecting uh, developers. So developers didn't know they were including this in their software and then providing it out. Um, if you ran the software that had BankBot installed in it, it would run in the background uh, on an Android device, and it would wait for you to trigger your own banking application. So say you are using um, or whichever banking app, it doesn't really matter. Um, say you're a day trader. You're opening up your day trading application. The first screen that pops up is a login screen, you think. Should be. But what happens is BankBot sees you opening that application up and draws its own screen on top of the real application. And it has a place for you to put in your email and your or log in your password. So you put in your log in your password, the screen just goes blank. It, 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 it doesn't say anything. It just goes and looks exactly the same. Well, what's happened is actually you've put your information into a screen drawn on top of the screen you're expecting that looks exactly like the screen you're expecting. So you don't notice the fact that you just gave out your login and password to somebody else. You, then you do it the second time and it works. Oh, whatever, whatever happened, it was just sort of broken for a second. That exact system works over and over and over again uh, for these guys. They have reintroduced this out into Google Play and other sources many, many times. It is um, a, a really bad uh, issue um, and it exists. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about Google again, which is another attack. It's actually the single largest attack against Google ever found. Um, I know that you're probably going to think, uh, well, well uh, there was a, a G plus hack, but uh, honestly, it's G plus. Who, who actually used a G plus in this room? Um, Google, again, actually is a little bit of a different hack. So the basic idea here is that, again, people went out and created some applications, put them on the Google Play Store uh, in different locations around the world, as well as alternate stores. People downloaded those applications and installed the application and ran it. 
So what happened in they ran these applications is that it did a temporary rootkit on the device without notifying the user, of course, um, or you know, forcing them to hit yes to a whole bunch of, of properties. But they did, and they ran it, and they made the application alive. When that application went live with that temporary rootkit, it stole your authentication token off the device. Now, if you're not familiar with what that authentication token does, one of the things it does is allow somebody to access your Google Play Store account and rate applications as five-star apps. And that is exactly what they started out doing. And they sold that as a service. That's great. I can, I can now have a million users rate your application as five stars. That's my service. I'm going to sell it for 2000 bucks each, whatever, you know, whatever the, the case might be. And that's what they did. That's what this, the bad guys started doing is selling that service of rating applications as five-star apps. OK, fine. I don't care. And as a user, when I see my, my information, I say, why did I rate all these apps as five stars? I don't know, even know any of these applications. You don't even pay attention to it. It's below your threshold of care. But there's a problem. That authentication token doesn't just allow you to rate those apps as five-star apps. It also allows you full access to any and all Google services without two-factor authentication, without identification of the individual device. You can use that token anywhere from any system for any reason for any user with that authentication token. And that includes Google Docs, Google for Work, um, Android uh, Enterprise. It includes. Um, any type of third-party authenticator against Google, you name it, anywhere and everywhere, Google is broken for 1.3 million users. Now, I, what I'll say is, in terms of this is the time frame for it. Um, it was active for nine weeks. Uh, it was active initially. We reported it to Google. It took Google about three weeks to come back and say, oh, yeah, that's an issue. And then it took another six weeks to solve the problem. So just put those time frames in the back of your head in terms of how long it takes to solve a major issue um, with a company. Um, I, I'll just say this. It's, it's something that we're proud of. We got a little plaque because we found this from Google. They, they entered us in their, uh, their Hall of Fame. So we like that, but we thought it was kind of cool. Um, but just to, to talk a little bit about the um, overall types of attacks. So I, I've been talking about a number of different uh, attacks, some of them applications, some of them hacking APIs, some of them hacking other systems. Mobile devices have a lot of vectors of attack and things that we don't necessarily control. When we talk about our laptops in endpoints, we generally provide VPNs, we provide disk encryption, we provide lots of ways to keep those systems very secure. On mobile devices, we depend upon somebody else to do that for us. We depend upon somebody else to make sure those devices are okay, whether it's Google or Apple, um, or if you have BlackBerry devices or, or Microsoft or whatever else. All those types of devices, you know, we're depending upon somebody else to secure them for us. But the problem is that's not really a terribly realistic expectation. Microsoft, I mean, uh, uh, Google and Apple are out to sell devices uh, to as many people as possible. If they make their devices too secure, they'll be annoying for some users, and that's it. So lowest common denominator says their security requirements, their maximum security, is not going to be as high as what you would want it to be. So that leaves us a couple of different types of attack vectors. Infected applications, obviously we, are, we can understand that particular theory. Um, we have network attacks. When you connect to a network, there is no guarantee as to what that network is. It is a $100 device. I'm sure most of you know or have heard of a pineapple device. But 100 bucks buys you a hacking tool that can take over a mobile device. Um, we have OS exploits, jailbreaking, rootkitting, or taking a, advantage of settings and systems on devices um, that you're not necessarily familiar with. Um, the biggest attack vector right now that we see uh, at all on mobile devices is phishing and smishing. Uh, for one reason or another, when people receive an SMS, they are very likely to click on a link in an SMS. You would never click on a random link from somebody you don't know in an email, but people do click on links and SMSs, and the bad guys realize this, and they are using that as an absolute attack vector to get into your systems, to get data out of your systems. Um, just as a quick little uh, tidbit, we, we actually were working with a different pen testing company at some point, and they did SMS um, pen testing with a particular company, did a whole bunch of training saying, don't click on links that look like this. Do you agree on pain of job? Do you agree to not click on links like this? So of course, all the people at these particular companies said, yes, we agree, we understand, we'll never click on these types of links. Three months later, they sent out the SMSs that actually duplicated those original links. 70% of the people clicked on the links. When asked, why did you click on the links? The response from a regular user, I, I was curious. And that was it. That was enough for them to click on a link that allowed them to lose data, to give out logins, give out passwords, give out information about the company, and allow somebody else to take over their stuff. 
And finally is SS7. Um, this is not something I'll talk about today too much, but um, SS7, if you're not familiar with it, um, it, it, if you are familiar with it, it hasn't gone away. If you're not familiar with it, it is the switching system upon which the old POTS phone network is based. But cell phones actually still use this network. They still use SS7 as a signaling system, as a way to do stuff. The problem is that SS7 is secure because it's, it's over there. It's in a building 10 miles away with a DMS100 switch. The problem is that's the sum total of security in SS7. If you tell SS7, do this, it does it. And there are ways for hackers to go and talk to a CLAC somewhere in the middle of Russia. Hey, can you issue a command? I want to listen into this person's conversations. Can you issue a command that allows me to listen into it? Sure, no problem. Um, if you want, that, we can give you a, a there's a link to um, uh, 60 Minutes uh, did a piece on this. It's about a 15-minute YouTube video. Search for it, SS7 hack, 60 Minutes. You'll love it. It's, it's fantastic. Or you'll hate it, depending upon your point of view. Um, but it is definitely a way of attack. Um, and then to kind of bring this a little bit back together, uh, when we went and did a bunch of research with uh, different customers and different people, uh, we wanted to understand what is the prevalence. How many companies out there have actually experienced hacks, have experienced issues in their mobile devices? Um, and what we found is we went out to customers who had um, more than 500 devices. So 850 of our customers that had over 500 devices have you been attacked? Have you connected to mobile networks that were malicious? Have you installed malware on your devices? And we found that every single one of them had. Uh, we found that uh, a whole bunch of them had jailbroken, rootkitted devices. We found, uh, we actually found uh, some amazing companies, some very, very high-end companies, had enterprise certificates installed in the research department, and they had no idea. If you're not familiar with what an enterprise certificate is, it's um, the ability to install and run uh, basically self-developed applications, which is fine on an Apple device except for the fact that this particular company had a ton of enterprise certificates installed in their devices from other companies, from places they didn't know anything about, uh, from hacked uh, sites. If you're familiar with um, uh, 25PP or vShare, they're basically app stores for Apple uh, devices that have nothing to do with the Apple App Store at all. They just use hacked uh, enterprise certificates and allow you to download pirated software. Um, and ask, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you don't know how to do it, ask any eight-year-old. I guarantee you they'll figure it out really quickly. So. Now I've talked a lot. I want to show you a little demo of, of basically trying to put a question. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Um, on that last slide, yes, sir. the bottom down there said you've got the uh, N850. Um, do you know if that study was done on BO, BYOB devices or like enterprise provider devices? BYOD. Okay. So for the most part, the customers that we're talking about here the, were mostly BYOD. Not all of them, though. So one of the customers uh, in particular, the one I was talking about with the enterprise certificates, was about 50-50. Um, and we basically assumed, uh, we assu made a lot of assumptions. We walked in, we assumed that they would have, this particular company would have nothing. Um, uh, actually, I can talk about them, sorry. It, it would be Samsung, uh, Samsung Research. We figured that they would not have any issues whatsoever. Um, they were actually one of the ones with the biggest set of issues. And they had about a 50-50 distribution of assigned devices and non-assigned devices. Um, and uh, just to put, just to be clear, yes, it was Samsung, but we're talking about um, uh, 1,500 devices, 50-50 split of iPhone and uh, Android devices, and out of that, a 50-50 split of uh, CYOD and BYOD, so, or COD, corporately owned devices. So, yeah, I mean, it was really interesting to us to see that um, at the end of the day. Uh, but now I'm going to show you a quick demo, and this demo uses a lot of the technologies and things and tack vectors all combined into one. It uses OS exploits, it uses malicious networks, um, it uses some user confusion, um, and it uses uh, some basic application hacking. So without further ado, uh, here is an MDM. If you're not familiar with this MDM, don't worry about it. It looks like all the other ones in terms of the aspect. We believe, for one reason or another, MDMs are enough to secure our devices. But understand that the MDM's point of view and the MDM's purpose in life comes from a corporately owned world where all you care about is inventory management and policy management. The security is there because, well, it's a BlackBerry device, it's secure. It's an Apple device, it's secure. That's it. That is their sum total of security. But we believe that these provide security down to the device when they kind of provide something but not necessarily security. They do a great job in policy and inventory management, though. And what we're saying here with this particular device and this particular screen, and all we're trying to demonstrate is that there is a device. It is on an MDM. It is compliant with the requirements of the MDM. It has installed the policies that MDM creates, and it is a managed device. It's 
perfectly normal. In this case, it's running iOS 11.2.2. It does not matter. It is, what I'm going to show you works just well on 12, 12.1, 12 and 12.1.1 beta. I am running it, so I know this for sure. Um, uh, but I don't recommend 12.1.1 beta. It's the point. It's uh, not very good. But any, either way, so say you're traveling the world and you have this device and you go to Hack Airport. I know I have bad humor. But either way, you go to Hack Airport and you land and you need to get a document out. You need to do something. You need to send some data. Uh, so you connect to the Wi-Fi network because, you know, you need to send a whole bunch of stuff and the roaming network there isn't working or whatever the case might be. You connect to the Wi-Fi network, just like most of you are probably connected to the Wi-Fi network here um, at, at the school. So you connect, and everything seems fine. It, you know, you connect, and when you do, you get a pop-up on your device that says, hey, you are connected to the airport Wi-Fi. Click here to continue. You need to do this, you know, whatever the, the statement is. Now, I will say that no one in this room is going to get that thing and probably continue. You're going to go, what the hell is this, and then do something else. But if you're an HR person and you're desperate to get a job done, and that pops up and says, click here to continue, you're going to do exactly what you see on the screen. You're going to install the profile that it's telling you to install, and you're going to click next a whole bunch of times. The problem is that entire process put that device under somebody else's control. That was it. That device is now controllable. Now, it's not ready just yet, but it has set up the scene for a particular type of uh, control. Um, what we've done just so far is install a profile that allows uh, non, uh, or it basically allows redirection of traffic, it allows HTTPS inspection, it allows a couple of other things. And this is all done perfectly legally as far as Apple's system is concerned. We're not hacking anything. This isn't a true hack. This is an OS exploit. We're exploiting the way that the device actually functions and works and is designed to function. And the next screen, you're going to see an application install. And I, I try to preface this because it's pretty quick. It's real time. Um, there's going to be a screen. It is the normal screen that you see when an application is installed and pushed down by any MDM. There is nothing different about what you'll see in the next screen. And in fact, it actually has a server name in the, in the dialog box. That server name is exactly what the user expects. It is their corporate MDM that they see. So without further ado, the MDM is pushing something. We see right in the middle of the screen, app installation. Well, that's my server. Okay, fine, install. So you install, and you see at the bottom there's an application installing onto the device, and hey, mobile conference, what's that? My company, we're going to be having a conference. I'll open it up. I don't know what this is. Ah, oh, whatever. My company sent it. It's fine. It'll go in the background. I'm not worried about it. But that's it. That was the hack. This particular application, we know to be a hack because we wrote it. We actually used it for a keynote presentation at a different, uh, different place. Um, and what we did was we wrote this application to do a couple of things. Um, and it actually takes uh, uh, audio, it takes contacts, calendars, and a bunch of other things and packages it up and sends it at will. So once this user has this application installed and once they've run it the once, they can leave the network they're at and they can go wherever they want and then we can trigger it at any time that we decide as a hacker. We can say to that device, I want you to give me some information right now. So what we did, we used this, at this uh, particular thing at, at RSA. So RSA had asked us to do a keynote speech there. We go out to keyno the, do the keynote speech, and we decide to write the application and bring it out as a true demonstration. Well, how can we make that even better? Well, how about this? You know how they have posters all over the place at a lot of presentations, a lot of events that have, like, maybe they used to have QR codes on everything. Well, what we did was we just went over to, uh, to Kinko's and printed out our own QR codes, went back to RSA, and just kind of taped them over the QR codes on the walls. You know, so it, the, the simplest physical hack you can come up with. You know, figure most people probably will scan it and go, what the hell is this, and move on. But some people will go, okay, and they'll scan it. And what we did was get in front of the crowd and go, hey, uh, you know, thank you, everybody, for joining. Jim, I know that you have a meeting in 10 minutes. I hope you'll stay around for the rest of the presentation. And Stephanie, you know, thank you for coming here from uh, Starbucks 10 minutes ago. We know that you're all caffeinated. And you can see people just going, huh, that's not so good. You know, so we actually had real information about the, the crowd. And, and the funny part about this is that well, RSA actually kicked us out right afterwards. Um, uh, they, they were less than pleased with, with our actions. Um, but we discussed it with them and showed them what we had done. And they, they, they actually weren't, the crazy thing is, they really weren't too, super, uh, too super displeased with us doing the mobile conference attack. Uh, they were actually displeased with the fact that we called it RSA mobile conference and we changed the name and then everything's fine. We, we come back, we go to RSA every year. Um, we, they, they, they like us at this point. So. Um, 
so what does this mean to the MDM? You know, so we have a device, we have a hack installed on it, it's ready to go, we can trigger it at any time, we can listen in on conversations, we can get contact and get calendar information out of it. Well, here we have the MDM, the device is not compromised, the device has no violations, um, and in fact, if we go into the device, uh, in the system itself, and we look at the device, we can see that the application was installed by the MDM, it thinks. It wasn't, but the MDM thinks it was installed, and it thinks it's a managed app by the MDM, because the MDM isn't smart enough, because the operating system isn't smart enough to know anything. All it knows is it was installed. The MDM says to the device, hey, do you have any managed apps? And the device goes, yes, I do. You installed it. It's great. That's it. That is the sum total of the experience. And unfortunately, that leaves the user hacked and leaves you, you know, definitely, if you're looking for the app, but how do you know how to look for the app? That's where, you know, you need some other system and, and other ways to, to think about it. Um, and it's something that we do think about. Um, and a lot of companies, and I won't go too much into sales, but just to, to be clear, there are a lot of different types of things you need to think about when you're looking at mobile devices. You need to think about malware and think about the time frame that the malware is out there. Absolutely, Google and Apple are very good at killing stuff over time. They are not good at zero day. Uh, it takes nine weeks for them to, or it took nine weeks to, for them to solve the biggest hack ever against Google. So think about that in the time frame. Um, we've seen a lot of different attacks on applications. We've seen the malicious attacks on Wi-Fi and have demonstrated that. Um, you can obviously think of uh, Bluetooth attacks. You can think of the browsing that your users are doing. Is it okay? Are they being tricked into going to websites? Are they being uh, using different sites? Are you using different systems? Um, there are lots of different things for you to think about. So um, I just want to leave it with this. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm here. Otherwise, you can find me at the booth later. And you know, really appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody.